Good afternoon again. Good tanghali po ulit sa inyong lahat. My name is Tony Lambino. I just joined Erie uh, recently, three weeks ago, as head of communication. Uh, I was uh, away from the country for 11 years. Um, but primarily, the mission of the organization is what convinced me and my family to come back. Um, as uh, mentioned earlier, uh, and our, the chairman of uh, and the, the convener, uh, Dr. Hiro Nisila, uh, picked up on uh, something that President uh, Pinoy, uh, in his message delivered by Secretary Alcala, said about rice science is for improving food products for the betterment of society. Um, and that means nutrition, that means food security, that means broader impacts that uh, Dr. Akim Doberman spoke about earlier in his keynote. Economic development, sustainable development, um, such issues as inclusive, uh, inclusivity in social and economic areas. Anyway, um, I also would like to quote another president uh, from a foreign country who said, these new rice trains the technical training you are giving, which uh, do more to escalate the war against hunger than anything that I know of that is being done today. Because if we are to win our war, and the only important war that really counts, if we are to win our war against poverty, against disease, against ignorance, against illiteracy, and against, and against hungry stomachs, then we have to go to succeed in projects like this. Lyndon B. Johnson in, 19, in 1966 at the International Rice Research Institute. I uh, just wanted to share that because that vision and that mission continues until today at Erie and uh, with our partner organizations. So, with that, sabi ko nga po, bago lang po ako sa Erie, when they asked if I would be willing to MC a session on uh, during this symposium, I said that would be fantastic. When they said it was GM Rice with some of the sharpest journalists in the country, I said, uh oh. <laughs> and when they said, don't worry, these are very well informed, articulate uh, uh, reporters and journalists, I said, that I said thank you, and in my mind, I said that makes my life even more difficult. But actually, not not really, because uh, I'm just here to moderate the session. And uh, please know that we are on a tight timeline. So thank you very much uh, again for joining us, and we'll uh, start without further ado. Um, on our panel, we have five individuals, um, very well respected in their own fields and in the field of rice science. And if I may just introduce them quickly, the first to speak will be Ms. Sophie Clayton, who is Public Relations Manager at Erie, and the lead uh, with her team who organized this particular session. So thank you, Sophie, and your colleagues for making this possible. Uh, Sophie manages a team who promotes and communicates Erie's rice research and its impacts and benefits. Uh, we also have Dr. Hei Leung, who is Principal Scientist and Program Leader, Genetic Diversity and Gene Discovery at Erie. Um, he is a plant pathologist and geneticist with a primary interest in disease resistance and genetic diversity research. Um, Mr. Tam Navacero is Senior Executive in leading startup and publicly listed firms in the United States and Asia with a focus in turning around distressed assets and seeding growth. He's the founding trustee of the Genomics Institute of Asia, or GINA, and Managing Director at Philab Industries. Dr. Akim, Akim Doberman is Deputy Director General for Research at UN, and he's a soil scientist and agronomist with 25 years of experience working in Asia, North America, and Europe. And Dr. Antonio Alfonso, who is the coordinator of the Biotechnology Program at the Department of Agriculture is the current coordinator of the Philippine DA's biotechnology program, and his research includes rice nutritional enhancement and improvement of resistance to drought and insect pests and diseases through conventional and non-conventional breeding methods. So to start us off, the lead organizer of this session, PR manager at Erie, Ms. Sophie Clayton. Okay. Thank you. 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 Th
Thank you very much, Tony. Well, welcome everybody to Let's Talk GM Rice, the media event of the 7th International Rice Genetics Symposium. Rice Genetics, for those of you that don't know, is the science behind understanding rice genes and is critical to developing new varieties of rice, both GM and non-GM. Since farmers first started cultivating rice and selecting their best performing rice to grow, they have been changing the genetic composition of rice. Today's rice breeders have much more sophisticated knowledge about rice genes and use that knowledge and modern ways to breed rice to develop even better types of rice with a whole range of useful and beneficial characteristics. The International Rice Genetics Symposium is all about understanding rice genes, sharing that knowledge and using it to improve rice. There is lots of fascinating rice genetic research that you can learn about across the symposium this week and I hope you all take the opportunity to go to the different sessions and talk to the scientists who are here to learn about their research. But at today's events, we have a great panel of experts, as introduced already by Tony, who can ha hopefully answer your questions specifically about GM rice and GM rice research at IRI and the Philippine Rice Research Institute. I am not one of the experts on GM rice, but part of my role is to help communicate what we are doing at IRI and why, and we get lots of questions about GM rice. <laughs> At ERI, we are committed to sharing all the wonderful science the Institute does and communicating the impact rice research and the breeding of new rice varieties can have on reducing poverty and improving food security. As rice consumers ourselves, although maybe not at lunch today, we know that the price of rice can directly impact our own lives. If rice prices go up, there's less money to buy other things. But it's worse for those people who have the least. When rice prices go up, they can wreak havoc on these people's lives. It may mean they can't afford other basics like a diversity of nutritious food and health care, and that can push them further into poverty. While we don't have farmers joining us today, I would certainly encourage you to take the time to talk to a rice farmer sometime, and you can talk to me or any of my team if you want to arrange that. You will learn pretty quickly how much they value rice varieties that produce more rice, and the impact producing more rice has on their lives, and the lives of their families and communities. To give you an idea of how rice genetics and rice breeding can help, an assessment of Erie's work to develop new rice varieties showed that it was responsible for a rise in rice yields of 13% across nearly 25 years in three Southeast Asian countries, including the Philippines. For farmers in the Philippines, this means they now earn an extra 2,300 pesos, about 52 US dollars, per hectare from using improved rice varieties derived from the breeding work of Erie. This kind of direct impact on the incomes of farmers goes a long way to lifting people out of poverty. More productive rice fields can lead to more rice in the market to sell, which in turn can help rice prices to stay stable and affordable for rice consumers. Therefore, helping rice consumers out of poverty as well. But what does all this have to do with GM rice? Well, GM is one of the ways that we can breed new types of rice. At Erie, we are using GM to help us understand rice genes and to see if we can develop a new and vastly more productive type of rice, known as C4 rice, and to develop more nutritious rice, such as golden rice. GM is also one of the topics we often get asked about, even though it is a very small part of our overall research. To set the scene, it is important to start by stating that there are currently no commercially available GM rice varieties grown anywhere in the world yet. However, many organisations, including IRI, are researching GM rice because we believe GM rice has the potential to offer unique benefits that we can't achieve through other breeding methods. But GM crops and GM food are not new. Across the planet, other GM crops have been grown since the 1990s and are currently planted by millions of farmers in around 30 countries on more than 170 million hectares. Here in the Philippines, GM corn is already grown by farmers and a number of other GM foods such as soybean and canola are approved for consumption and eaten here. So while GM rice would be new, it wouldn't be the first GM crop or food for the world, for Asia or even for the Philippines. Nevertheless, we know people are curious about GM rice and have questions and concerns about it. So we're looking forward to talking to you about our GM rice research today. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. And we also, in the interest of transparency and reaching as many interested uh, members of the public as possible, are, are webcasting this session through live.iri.org, L-I-V-E dot I-R-R-I dot O-R-G. So for those of you who are blogging in the room, uh, would really appreciate the, you know, the send out to your 
readers. Also, there's live tweeting going on at hashtag RiceGenetics7. RiceGenetics7, one word. Without further ado, let's continue with uh, Dr. He Leong, who is the principal scientist and program leader of the Genetic Diversity and Gene Discovery Group at Erie. He will be talking about the value of rice genes. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, since we're talking about gene uh, a lot in the next uh, number of sessions, so I'd like, like to just get us on the same page. Um, exactly uh, 1955, that's when they discovered that the DNA sequence, actually DNA as a molecule, as a uh, chemical entity, actually encode gene that give us our inheritance and characteristic. So gene basically is a piece of uh, DNA sequence on our chromosome. Like human, you and me have 23 pairs. And in rice, there are 12 pairs. So just in visualize it, it's a gene is sitting on a chromosome. Um, now, over the years of evolution, gene accumulate uh, differences. And that's what constitutes genetic variation. So, so the breeding program at Yuri for years is relying on this uh, enormous amount of genetic variation. So rice as a crop is unusual in the sense that it's a very deep, uh, uh, huge amount of variation. And those of you who may have attended this morning, we talk about genetic variation, variation the whole morning. Uh, rice is, uh, is very well endowed. And Yiri particularly well endowed in the sense that FAO entrusted us to keep a gene bank uh, which holds about 117,000 accessions. Now so that is almost like a gold mine for us to, to, to find out genetic variation and uh, try to understand it. And, and so for the, all the, most of the Yiri activity, I would say 95% of genetic work is surrounding these natural variations. And Jim, uh, I came to talk about it. The GMO, GMO work is a, a relatively uh, small proportion of what we do. So I just want to uh, explain a little bit how we're exploring the gene bank. So the gene bank, as I said, is 100,000 possessions. And yet, uh, we estimate that uh, plant breeding over the years, over many years, uh, only use about 5% of the genetic variation. And maybe we look at about 25% of the, of the accession. And so we're really digging only the tip of the iceberg in terms of using diversity. So as I said, that most of our activity is surrounding about understanding the, the diversity and the meaning of it and try to use it. And sometimes uh, we, we try to, we, over the years, we have a lot of successes. So all the uh, stress tolerance, like uh, disease and insect resistance, are coming from the natural variation. And our more recent uh, success, including flood tolerance, uh, salinity, salt tolerance, and as well as, as, well as drought tolerance. So these are, are early, uh, success that we can derive from genetic variation. And yet, at times, we want to look for something, but it's not there. So that's when we have to look for additional means to enhance our green program. And then uh, today's topic about the golden rice, finding uh, pro-vitamin A uh, 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 rice is one of the examples. That is, we, we try our best in the past, past few years to look for, we look for yellow rice because we think that uh, vitamin A rice will be yellow. But then we couldn't find it. We couldn't find it. So in such cases, we have to look for other means. That's the basis why we talk about the golden rice. Okay. So, and there are other cases, the nutritional trait like iron, maybe we don't have enough iron in the rice grain. So we are also exploring the genetic, uh, uh, other genetic engineering approaches. So, so that leads to my, my point that, that in order to understand rice diversity and, and make good use of it, so we are launching an ambitious program uh, uh, last started a few years ago is to using uh, technology to sequence all the sessions or majority of sessions uh, to unreveal the I would say the mystery or, or the 
decoding the, the, the unknown about these rise of session. So by knowing, just imagine by knowing the fingerprint, detailed fingerprint, DNA fingerprint of these accessions will allow us to, to uh, make the use of it. So I think this is timely for me to pass the microphone to Tom, who will talk about his, how his, his organization is helping Erie in working on this uh, sequencing project. Thank you, Dr. Tom. Leon. I'm Tom Navasero. I'm probably the non-geneticist here. I'm called a YouTube geneticist. I learned most of my genetics from YouTube. Uh, but as an engineer, I understand Semicon. And uh, the solution to sequencing 117,000 varieties in, in good time or in a good economic way is to do it cheaply and fast. As you know, 10 years ago, it took uh, over, what, several years and, and $3 billion to sequence the human genome. I'd like to make an announcement today that uh, GINA, which stands for Genomic Institute of Asia, uh, which we seated as a not-for-profit entity, uh, sequenced the first Filipino reference for black rice. So this will be announced on Friday, and you're all welcome to join uh, the launching of uh, GINA uh, at Erie uh, this Friday for lunch. So there we will hand off or hand over the first initial reference of the first Philippine uh, rice reference, uh, black rice. GINA, as I said, is not for profit. It's equipped with technology that can basically, hopefully, sequence one day the key varieties in that gene bank of Dr. Tichi Chang. And those varieties uh, can then be used by our researchers. This machine uses a chip. Can you imagine? We can do 20 rice genomes in one chip under four to six hours. So there is possibility that we one day can at least do more than 5% of those 117,000 varieties, but hopefully do all so that the researchers can find out the specific phenotypes or the specific characteristics that they can use for breeding rice for the future. GINA does not stand for the Genetic Information Non-Discriminatory Act. This is one thing we need in this country because genetics is growing very fast. Uh, GINA stands for the institute that will help Erie, and we don't build institutions. We want to keep our costs down, so what we did was we set up satellite facilities. So we entered into a collaboration on their not-for-profit program with Erie so we can help Erie's research with rice. And we felt that this is important to us, especially to the Navasera family, because we've lived in Los Banos for the last 50 years. And I think Erie was one of our first clients. The key thing, though, is we are not just doing it for rice. We are also going to start the Filipino reference uh, for the Filipino human uh, for medical purposes. So one day we will complete the reference for the Filipinos and also improve the sequencing for our medical uh, traits, medical issues, cancer pounds, and so forth. So Gina is here not just for ag bio, but also for uh, medical reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Do we have any directly relevant questions to uh, what Dr. Hay or uh, Mr. Navasero talked about? We will have an opportunity to have a discussion at, at, toward the end of the session. Yeah. Okay, so let's continue. Um, thank you, Mr. Navasero. And uh, having discussed the richness of rice genetic diversity and the importance of using technology for uh, genetic sequencing, we now move to trying to answer the question, why GM rice? And to help us explore that, we have Dr. Akim Doberman, who is Deputy Director General for Research at Erie. Dr. Doberman. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll try to do this in, in relatively simple terms, which is easy for me because I'm not a geneticist anyway. I can't really speak in very complicated terms that uh, nobody understands. Uh, the expectation is that uh, with all the revolutionary progress that you've just heard about in terms of gene sequencing and the discovery of the functions of all of many of the genes that exist in many of the traditional as well as cultivated uh, varieties of rice, the expectation is that with all of that, we are going to make tremendous progress in conventional breeding. Because if we have those genes or if we understand their function, we can more specifically breed new rice varieties by choosing the right ones to cross with each other, 
using molecular markers to look for the presence of the genes we want and basically uh, achieve what I mentioned in my plenary talk this morning, produce better rice varieties in half the time than in the past. So that is the new big opportunity. And it's conventional breeding uh, enhanced with molecular biotechnology tools. And so it is also uh, a normal form of genetic modification. But there is this other form of genetic modification that often is uh, mentioned uh, under the term of GM or GMO or transgenic uh, that basically requires the transfer of one or more genes from another organism, which could be another plant, it could be a microorganism, or it could be even an animal of some kind, uh, into rice. So that's the distinguishing factor coming from something else other than rice. And the technology for that uh, is such that it allows us to do this uh, fairly precisely. So we are able to really say, okay, if we wanted to change rice in a way that naturally cannot be achieved, because it doesn't have enough variation in the available genetic gene, uh, gene pool of rice, if we wanted to change it by engineering a certain biochemical pathway differently, we need this or this gene from another organism to achieve that change. So it's basically a technology, if you wish, that uh, achieves modification of one or more genes that otherwise could be difficult to achieve or in some cases might evolutionary take millions of years to achieve, if you wish, or thousands of years. So that's the background, and I think it's very important to distinguishing this. It has nothing to do with molecular breeding uh, or hybrids. Uh, the, the, so it's basically a distinguishing the technology in which we precisely try to make a change in rice. And so we always have to therefore make a strategic decision. When does it make sense and when does it not make sense? Our default position for this is always it is much easier not to do it that way if we can. So and the majority of uh, rice breeding is that way. And why is that? Because uh, if we can achieve our goal in terms of improving the plant in a conventional sense, we can release this variety quickly. Whereas if we go the transgenic route or the GMO route, uh, we have to follow a very long process that includes uh, many stages of uh, evaluation and uh, deregulation. We have to go through uh, biosafety approval, we have to go through agronomic performance assessment, we would have to do any kind of environmental or nutritional health impact studies, and we have to do consumer acceptance uh, studies. And so you can see so the list of these things is long, and therefore, the development cost and time to do this would also be very long and expensive. That is the fundamental reason, or one of the fundamental reasons, why until now no GM rice has been released. It simply has taken a, it takes a long time, and uh, particularly public sector institutions often simply do not have the resources to do this. The GM crops that have been commercialized worldwide have primarily been developed by large private companies, including the BT and Roundup Ready Corn that is now dominating the corn market in the Philippines. So Monsanto, Pioneer, Syngenta and the likes. And they of course have the resources to do this and they have a commercial interest to do this because they patent the gene and put it into the background of a hybrid. And therefore you have a product to sell each year to your farmers. When we do GM rice, we have a very different philosophy. And the number one is we only do it for traits that have potentially large humanitarian impact. So when we talk about golden rice, it is because there are millions of people, particularly children and uh, women, who are vitamin A deficient. And all attempts to get rid of this vitamin A deficiency have failed so far.